wait a second. I've got to turn my notification noises off, otherwise they'll go off in the middle of things. And I don't want them to. Um, and the other thing is, and you know, last time after we did our intro, uh, Paul said, the way you do your intro, I was expecting you to say wild stallions <laughs> intro. It's, it, it, I'm uh, Theodore S. Preston. I'm here. Wow, stallions! <laughs> okay, well, it, it's well, passed me by, I'm afraid, but but feel have free. Have you not seen Bill and Ted? <laughs> I haven't. I haven't. Oh, you must. Right, okay. Your homework assignment is to watch okay. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures. Okay. Well, well Bill and Ted's Burger Journey. <laughs> good. <laughs> Anyway, right, okay. I am now properly ready. <laughs> Excellent. I think you start. My name's Caroline Beckett. Oh, okay. <laughs> My name is Caroline Beckett, and I'm the Vicar of Brightening Sea, and I'm no longer self-isolating. Yay, and my name's Andy Griffiths, and I coordinate training for the Diocese of Chelmsford, and I'm working from home. And together. We are, at, we a are at a distance, rethinking re Christian, Christian leadership. leadership. So this is episode two, and in our first conversation, we made the claim that, at least in part, Christian leadership is community organising. And we started thinking about what that means in a pandemic. So Andy, how have you been spending your time? Well, I've been organising. Um, community organisers reckon that's always the first thing to do. You don't decide where the bus is going and then persuade people to get on. You assemble people on the bus and then together the people decide what route the bus is going to take. So some of us have formed a group bound together by the value of kindness. There's a Facebook group and that's gone from zero to 4,000 members in, well, I guess it's about a week now. It's not a volunteering scheme in its own right, but we're in partnership with bigger groups like the NHS and the council and smaller scale groups like local churches who are running volunteer schemes. Um, it's not my initiative. A young Christian leader called Hannah took the lead, but I've been one of the admins and I've been doing what I can behind the scenes. Caroline, it's exhausting. 4,000 members have produced 25,000 posts in five days. Oh, Each one needs to be vetted and there always seems to be someone kicking off because they're scared or they're angry or they're needing reassurance because they're sad or isolated or shutting down because they've heard from a friend of their uncle that you just have to gargle with warm water or the army is coming to Chelmsford High Street in a tank. Uh, so my role, I think, is trying to bring the positivity. We've even composed some collaborative poetry. And poetry sure is all the awesome in a crisis. Well, you know, some people might say it's all just a kind of complicated waste of time. No one warned us the apocalypse would have so much paperwork associated with it. But community organisers say <laughs> that individual action is not sufficient. We need institutions, whether they're mosques or churches or table tennis clubs or residence associations or something that might emerge from a Facebook group. If you want to change the world, don't start by doing good. Start by joining an institution. So you see, I've got dreams of what this group of 4,000 people could become in due course, perhaps in months from now. I reckon if we can persuade everyone in that group to join an institution of some kind and then persuade them to use their influence to help those institutions to join up and pull their power, I, I reckon Chelmsford could be completely transformed. That, that's what I think. But two... That's, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, well, two problems with the vision. The, the, the first is I don't get to decide what a large group of people does. I only get to uh, present possibilities and then they get to choose. 
And secondly, it's probably a bit too early for me to have too many of those dreams. I mean, now is what we've got, but now's all we have. Um, I'm struck that when the temple got destroyed in uh, uh, the Old Testament, uh, God didn't come straight in with second Isaiah saying, it's all right, there's hope, there's going to be a new beginning. He let them mourn a bit. He, he, he let them lament. And in the same way, now isn't the time for us to be formulating plans for after the epidemic. Now's the time to hold people together as best we can and do uh, what's possible now. Now, how about you, Caroline? How was Sunday morning, and two Sunday mornings, I guess, since we, uh, um, since we started this series, given it was the first time since 1208 that British churches didn't gather for worship on a Sunday? What happened in 1208? Uh, the plague, I think. Ah, well. Um, in Brightling Sea, it's, it's been quite interesting. So I've been broadcasting um, bits and pieces. So I broadcast from my church when we were still allowed to do that. And that was a very weird experience because there was just myself and my husband to uh, ring the altar bell and my church warden away, way away from us in the church porch, ringing the, uh, the church bell. And we did a Eucharistic prayer and a blessing. And then I recorded a sermon at home and I added that in as well. But it was very strange because I found myself, as I was stood there in an empty church, picturing all the faces. And normally, you, you know how it is in churches, we have a number of congregations they're one congregation in reality there are about seven or eight different congregations and they don't all know, know each other but I found as I looked out I had to picture people because otherwise it would have been too weird and uh, and I pictured all the faces but not all the faces of one congregation but all the faces of all the congregations sort of all spliced in together and uh, there were there were moments where I could almost see them sat in their familiar seats and that is an advantage I suppose in the Church of England you know where they would have sat so you can imagine them there. Um, and it just helped me to picture the people that I love and care for sitting in those seats um, as I was celebrating Eucharist. Um, I mean, it was, it was a funny experience because theologically we do, you can receive the body and blood of Christ on behalf of the congregation. Um, I feel a little bit strange and elitist doing it. And, and it wasn't a conference. And I think, to be honest, um, when the the ruling came that we weren't allowed in our churches, part felt really guilty that I was there and they weren't. Um, and so, actually, to have an even playing field felt better for me. I'm aware it's uh, it's caused my um, congregations and and also a lot of my colleagues some difficulties. Um, so this week I broadcast um, just a sermon from home um, and I'm looking at finding a tidy bit of house um, to set up maybe a little altar and, and think about doing um, communion from home but I'll be honest the chaos hasn't permitted it so far um, and at the moment I'm kind of busy because I'm I'm trying to be a 50-50 vicar at the moment. So, so can you explain 50-50? Um, so it's a term program and it's the idea that I'm both the vicar of Brightlingsea and I'm the leader of a church of England congregation there. So I should be spending about half my time caring for those who are members of a gathered congregation or, you know, would be in non-pandemic times. Um, and about half again concerned with a wider community who aren't actually part of the congregation at all, but they're just as important to God. And it's the internal and the external like breathing in and breathing out. That's important, isn't it? Because at times like this, it'd be really easy to spend all of our time just taking care of uh, our people, as it were, to, um, uh, to, or on the other hand, to forget we have a congregation at all and leave them isolated 
instead of getting a phone list and calling round. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it is that balance. And then in my mix as well, of course, there's food bank and keeping that running and my role as the trustee. But I found it's also possible to spend more energy trying to live stream stuff or trying to learn the tech or trying to record things and make them perfect. Um, and actually, I'm not willing to spend too much of my time on putting out the perfect reflection on Facebook, because to be honest, those, there are so many of my colleagues who are doing amazing daily reflections on Facebook. Anyone in my congregation who's capable of using Facebook can just access them. So I'm just saying, you know, check out so-and-so, look at so-and-so. That way I don't have to do it and I can actually focus on the people who can't engage in that way. Um, so one of the things that I've done is I've just um, done a deal with the wonderful local editor of a local newspaper that goes around our parish and all the parishes in our MMP, which is our version of an MMU, we're an MMP, a mission ministry partnership here, and it covers nearly all of the area that our churches cover. So he's gonna put an article in the paper for me and also a set of prayers for Holy Week so that people can join in from home who receive that newspaper because it goes through every door and it reaches people who are never gonna go on Facebook and don't have a smartphone and don't have a computer. So I found my time has been better spent praying mm. and finding ways to reach the people who can't access the brilliant stuff that's being accessed elsewhere. So 50-50, the idea of spending about half your time caring for the congregation and about half your time being the vicar of Brightlingsea, being there for the wider community. It's a really important balance, but just this week I heard from a friend of mine who's a vicar whose church warden said they didn't want him spending time organizing in the wider community until he was sure all the people in the congregation had been cared for but it doesn't work that way though that's that, that it works and the line between congregation and community at one for starters everybody's on a journey of faith but more for the point covid 19s over i don't want the people of brightening see saying well what use was the theater? and in a way the people of god need me less and the people who don't know god yet need me a whole lot more and while i can't do everything i can organize and i can listen and i can help people plan and tell stories and at the end i can invite them to the table of god but there needs to be some relationship and some link there first Absolutely. Agree 100 percent. But I, I'm positive. I'm optimistic. I think there are signs that the church has started to adjust. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, there was a certain amount of mourning by Christians when the churches had to be locked. And I do understand that. And I actually I recorded two little videos, two little farewells, one to each of my churches. and I found myself locking them up in a sort of ceremonial way and going around and praying in the different places and asking God to enable us to be back there and doing the familiar things soon. And it mm. felt quite important to say a farewell um, and to do it in some kind of, I don't know, so, some sort of ritual way that showed respect for the things we were locking up before we go on and try these, these other things. And I think that sometimes the mourning aspect is important because when, any, when any change happens, even a change that we choose, the old is polished and it's known and it's slick and it works and the new is messy and scraggly and unfamiliar and not very comforting. And uh, so the new is, is quite traumatic sometimes, I think, for people. And like you said earlier, the experience of the Jews when the temple was destroyed in exile, exile is traumatic. And it's interesting because synagogues were invented in the time of the exile. But then when the exile was over, Jewish people decided synagogues were a good idea and they'd keep them. I really believe that something is coming into being that's going to be useful long after COVID-19. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, but then you're a new shape of church kind of person. 
and so am I to a degree, but we need to be patient with those who need the buildings more than we do. And one of the things that I said on Twitter that was that um, some church leaders can't cope with not being allowed into their buildings. And it's a bit like um, kids being given a fabulous gift and just playing with the box and then crying because it gets all grubby and has to be thrown away. And actually the gift all the time is still there. And the gift is that God makes God's home in us and not in a building. And God is with us always, and that's the gift. But it wouldn't be a fair criticism of everyone to say, oh, you know, that there is no reasoning behind that, it's all knee-jerk. There is good reasoned theology behind some of the mourning. And particularly, there are members of my congregation who have Alzheimer's or dementia, who need the familiar and are feeling desperately disorientated. And uh, there was a guy who wrote a book, can't remember his name, who wrote a book called uh, Memory and Liturgy. And he was talking about how one of the functions of liturgy and the familiar is that it enables you to pick up the relationship where you left off. So you come into church and you simply pick up the dropped thread of when you were there last time and you slide into that familiar and that's a good thing. And so providing worship in the old expected way can be part of supporting people when everything else is uncertain. So hat tip to all those ministers who've managed to create an altar at home, who managed to salvage bits and pieces from church before church had to be shut down and who are faithfully doing that because really helping people. Um, and the, the other I'm noticing is that with the church shut down and with people no longer torn, there's a lot of focus on making the volunteer schemes work well, thinking about some of the institutional thinking that we can bring to the table there around safeguarding and taking safeguarding seriously. Yeah, I think so. And I, I said in the last episode that schemes that involve strangers just putting cards through the doors of vulnerable people with no safer recruitment, well, it just gave me the safeguarding heebie-jeebies. And I think that start, stuff has largely stopped now. Mm -hmm. And I think now viable schemes are running responsibly, either very locally, often through parish churches, or large scale through the county council or through the national scheme, Good Sam. I, I love it being called Good Sam. I know it's an acronym, but presumably whoever created the acronym Good Sam had the parable of the Good Samaritan in mind. Um, so here's me talking to yes. churches. Churches, please do not be a party to setting up an informal volunteer force without safer recruitment. The satisfaction of feeling like you're achieving something now is not worth the risks of abuse that you're going to be running in the long term. Mm -hmm. And the involvement of disabled people is a massive plus, I think. Well, yes, certainly. I mean, I have friends who've been successfully and wonderfully running online church for years. You know, they have been real forerunners of this, and we are Johnny Come Lately's. We are people who are very late to the party. And actually, I do think that um, we owe them an apology in lots of ways because they've been crying out in the wilderness for church to reach out to them and for church to be fully accessible to them. And there's been a lot of dismissal of online church as being, you know, not good enough and second rate and not real. And now suddenly, because it's all that everyone's got, um, now actually the theology is going in, the thinking is going in. And actually I've been really touched by the way that disabled and housebound Christians are welcoming us into what's been their holy ground, their sacred space. And they're generously leading us in ways, new ways of being together, in spirit and in truth, if not in body. And that's really, really helpful. Um, and I think that's incredibly gracious of them, after having not been listened to for years and years. My one concern is that able-bodied Christians um, suddenly don't decide that all of their wisdom and all of their experience and all of their leadership can just be swept aside because now we're here and we're going to do it. We're going to be the experts. And trust me, we're not. We are not the experts. And actually, there is a great deal of wisdom from those who've been doing this really well for a long time. 
church is adapting well, but I think it's important. Um, there's another community organizing principle, name your teachers. Don't just go on and use it, name your teachers. Say where you got it from, credit where it's due. Um, and I'm particularly indebted to Disability and Jesus um, and the various other folks who follow that and who are actively involved with that because um, they have been a real voice of wisdom for me. No, absolutely. So I'm really hoping that people are going to write to us and tell us their experiences at a distance. I'm at randomlyandy at live.com. And I'm at Rev Caroline Beckett at gmail.com. And in this episode, we're going to start to think about what community organising is. Today, we'll say it's a tradition and a set of tools. And in our next episode, we're going to be saying it's a rule and a process. First of all, it's a tradition. The tradition and terminology of community organising began with the creation of the Industrial Areas Foundation, IAF, in 1940 in Chicago by Saul Alinsky, backed by Roman Catholic Bishop Bernard Scheel and Old Etonian millionaire publisher Marshall Field III. Now there's a name. It spread across the US and in 1996 to East London without ever losing its Chicago base. And in the 1980s, right there in Chicago, it gained its most influential employee and advocate, Barack Obama who set out what he called the three premises of community organizing. One, power. The problems facing communities do not result from a lack of effective solutions, but from a lack of power to implement those solutions. Two, vision. The only way for communities to build long-term power is by organizing people and money around a common vision. And three, broad leadership from institutions that a viable organisation can only be achieved if a broadly based leadership and not one or two charismatic leaders can knit together the diverse interests of their local institutions. So community organising isn't just activism, mobilising as many people as possible to demonstrate for change. Community organising is about helping people work together. It's transforming institutions so that institutions can bring change. And secondly, it's a set of tools. Things like one-to-ones, which is a tool for having conversations, and house meetings, a tool for holding small group meetings, and power analysis, a tool for finding out who really holds the power, and tools for helping people tell stories. Joining a local community organising alliance, such as a Citizens UK it will open up the training you need to use tools like these. That's right, and Citizens UK are working right now at making some of this training accessible online. So Caroline, this could sound like sort of functional atheism, like we've just found a method for building communities, so we don't need the power of God anymore. So if that's how it sounds, keep listening. I promise that by the time this series... Oh, and uh, at this rate, virus might be consigned to history before at a distance is, we'll have covered preaching, pastoral care, evangelism, the gospel and the sacrament. Please don't let the fact that you're having to live confined to one place like a monk stop you having rhythms of prayer like a monk. In fact, now might be your moment to build those rhythms in. But the way we're structuring these conversations is that next time we'll finish explaining what community organising is, and then we'll unpack the process. It has five stages, which we're calling organising, listening, planning, taking action through public storytelling, and ensuring everyone has a place at the table. And we'll be reacting to your comments as we go along. Thank you for listening. We've been together at a distance, at a distance. Rethinking, rethinking Christian leadership. Rethinking.